so let's continue where we left off with large eddy simulation. I'll just review the few slides. Um, in LES, we compute everything that, that the grid can capture, and anything below the grid resolution is modeled. We call this subgrid, right? That's below the grid, subgrid. You're going to hear things like the subgrid stress tensor. When you hear that, what does that mean? A subgrid quantity is a quantity that is not captured by the grid cannot be calculated by the grid, cannot be represented by your numerical solution, so you have to model it, okay? For things to be meaningful, the grid resolution needs to be large enough, certainly larger than required for RANS models. So, in other words, the resolution needs to be smaller, okay? Because you need to capture enough of the eddies, so you need to have a, uh, this can be ambiguous, the meaning of the large grid, it means you, have, you need to have a large number of grid points, okay, to be able to capture meaningful structures, okay? Um, the idea of filtering is, looks like averaging. You decompose a turbulent quantity into a filtered quantity plus a, um, a fluctuating part. Well, the word fluctuating is not really correct. Phi prime, in this case, is really a subgrid quantity. That's the quantity that went through the, uh, that passed through the filter that the filter could not capture, that the grid could not capture. Again, think of the sieve. This is a great example. Any structures that are larger, any rocks that are larger than the sieve width are going to be captured, and anything smaller is going to go through. So the U primes are going to go through, and the tilt, phi tilt, are going to be captured. Okay? Some properties of the filter, I haven't defined the filter yet because we want to design a filter. We don't know what the mathematical operation of the filter is. And in practice, we never need that because the grid automatically captures those for you naturally, OK? Um, but there is a strong mathematical definition for the filter. And in some advanced, advanced large eddy simulation model, like the dynamics Magorinsky model, we have to, up, to explicitly apply a filter. So, and I'll show you the definition in a second. But some desirable properties of the filter is that it doesn't change constant, so the filter of a constant is a constant. It is linear, so the filter of a um, sum or, or subtraction is equal to the sum or, or difference of the filters, and it commutes with derivative time and space. Okay, so the filter of a derivative is equal to the derivative of the filtered quantity. Most importantly, the filter of the fluctuation is not zero. Again, I think I may I, I, I want to change that the wording fluctuation. It's not a fluctuation, it's a subgrid quantity. It's a quantity that could not that was not filtered. And again, think about the filter operation as you're applying a sieve. Okay? So once we applied the sieve on a bunch of rocks, if you apply the same sieve to whatever went through, they're still gonna go through. Unless you apply a uh, a, a finer sieve, but still then you're gonna capture some. But some is going to go through. So in other words, you know, you're not, you're not going to capture all the subgrid points with the filter. But uh, contrast that to Raymond's averaging, where the average of the fluctuation is zero. Because you design, you draw your average in a way that there are as many fluctuations above the average as there are below the average. So they add up to zero. The mathematical definition of the filter um, is called a, we call this a convolution. A convolution is just simply an integral of a function times another function. That's what a convolution is. Um, it, we, don't worry about the math here. We just, just, th just this is the definition of um, the filter, where you're filtering the quantity phi in space and time is defined as the integral over the entire space domain, okay, from minus infinity to infinity, of phi times this um, G, this G that's called the um, that's called the filter kernel, and it, it can have different shapes. It can be an exponential, it could be a heavy side function, etc. Um, X minus R, and notice how it acts. Um, it acts as a function of the location of phi. So the further away from from phi, the less effect it's going to have, and that distance X minus R is defined by the filter width. By the, that defines the sieve width, essentially. In practice, it's the grid resolution that gives you that filter width definition. Yeah? So uh, this might be a tough question, but in practice, if you keep making your sieve smaller and smaller, wouldn't you get to the? DNS. Yeah. Yeah, you'd get DNS. Okay. But, but, that, but then you, your computational cost, 
is going to climb exponentially, like we saw earlier, Reynolds to the 9 over 4th. Now, it, that brings up another point for computation. From a computational perspective, what we call a consistent large eddy simulation is a large eddy simulation that tends to di direct numerical simulation as your filter width approaches 0. Some implementations do not satisfy that property. You keep refining, refining, you still need to do a model, which means you're not doing the you're not doing a consistent LES. But that's kind of you know an academic exercise. Okay, um, filtering sub subgrid quantities. Now another another the way we write filters is just simply do G star phi. That's how we write the filter. Okay, just to simplify the process. But that's an integral. Okay, that's an integral. Okay. Now here's another proof that the fi filtering subgrid quantities is not zero. So a subgrid quantity phi prime, apply the filter. Phi prime is phi tilde minus phi, correct? Apply the filter to that. That means that g star phi tilde minus phi. Now, because g, um, because the integral is linear, then you can decompose this. You can do g, g star phi tilde minus g star phi. Now, g star phi is phi tilde, but g star phi tilde is not zero. It's not, and it's not phi tilde. And that's not different to, than zero in general. OK, so let me give you an example of an explicit filtering operation. Um, what I'm showing here is a signal, OK? Now think of this signal, um, although this is in 1D, but think of this as variation over space. So for example, if you think over here, there's strong variation in a small period of time or small distance. That means you have the, these structures. These are heavy structures over here going on here. right? These are complex structures over here and over here. So you need to capture those. And all the variation over here, you need to capture all of this. Now, what I'm going to show here is a um, filter. It's called the box filter. It's essentially like a step function, like a unit step function with a certain width. OK, if we change the width, we can change how we modify that, um, um, that signal. But what I'm showing here is the signal. And then I'm going to apply on it this, um, this filter. And as the filter moves in space, is going to modify the signal. See what happens? That's the definition of the filter. It has a width of about 1. And see how it modifies the signal. OK? We filtered it. So in other words, when we, ap we apply the filtering, this is, what we will, this is what we will capture. This is what, if we run a simulation with this box filter, this is what we will capture. We will not be able to capture the um, um, uh, subgrid quantities or these kind of interesting structures. Okay, we will not be able to capture those. Okay, but again, in practice, we never apply this explicitly. The grid will automatically resolve this. Okay, for you. Give you another example of in practice what you see: a RAN simulation. This is flow over the backward um, facing step from Onera. That's the um, French um, uh, equivalent of NASA. Um, uh, I forgot. Um, I forgot what it stood for. It stands for. Uh, was it? Uh, Europe, European. Anyway, so it's the French Space Agency, um, uh, Europe or European Space Agency. Anyway, um, that's the difference between RANS and LES for the flow over the backward facing step. RANs, you just you just capture on average what happens. Okay, with LES, you're going to capture some structures. Okay, but they're not the full DNS. If you do a DNS, you're going to capture even more finer structures over here. Okay, now loosely speaking, if any has does any one of you do photography? Has any one of you done photography? Okay, so RANs is the equivalent of a long time exposure. I don't know if you've seen these um, images of the Cotton Candy River. The river flows. Um, you can um, take a long exposure of the river, and then the flow is going to look so nice and smooth like cotton candy. That's why, because you've averaged, essentially over time, you've averaged all the structures that are um, going through. Okay. DNS, a DNS would be a very, very fast snapshot, like shutter speed, you know, one ten thousand, ten one ten thousandths, okay? Very fast, you capture all the structures. 
But then what is Elias? It's not an average. Okay, so it's not a long time exposure. It's actually a reasonably fast shutter speed. It's a slightly out of focus picture. Just a slightly out of focus, okay? So that you don't resolve all the structures. Okay, that's kind of the analogy. Anyway, so the filtered Navier-Stokes equations. Again, I'm presenting you the, with these as, you know, you, you're, I know most of you are not doing computing, but uh, if you end up doing some type of simulation, or, I mean, it's too good to at least understand what you see, a subgrid model, when you hear the word subgrid model, when you hear an average, okay, what these quantities mean, so that you don't just, you know, throw words out there. And you can always come back to these slides and look at them, okay? All right, so the filtered Navier-Stokes, we do the same thing. We apply the filter, um, again, on the transient term, inertial term, pressure, and diffusion. So all of these terms are linear. We understand that most of the challenge in turbulence comes from the nonlinear convective term. Agreed? Okay. So here's a little trick that we're going to do here. This UU tilt, the filter of um, the product UU, okay, I'm going to write it as, I want to write things in terms of U tilt, because I'm, I can solve for U tilt here, and there's V tilt, and there's U tilt, but this term is the problematic term. So I want to express this term, I would like to express this term in terms of U tilt and U times U tilt, right? So what we do, we say U U tilt is U tilt U tilt plus U U tilt minus U tilt U tilt. Okay, we didn't do anything, we just added and subtracted U tilt U tilt, correct? Okay, now what does this term represent? Think about it. UU tilt, so that's we filtered, okay, UU, that's, the, that's what we capture out of UU, okay? Minus U tilt, U tilt, that's what we capture of U tilt and U tilt separately, okay? The difference is actually whatever goes through. So really, this, is, this represents all the subgrid quantities that went through the grid for the quantity UU. So UU tilt is the quantity UU, just UU, a quantity on its own, that's been captured. But then U tilt, U tilt, so U tilt alone is the quantity U that was captured multiply that by itself, the difference gives you whatever we couldn't capture in the grid, with the grid, with the sieve, okay? Now, if you recall the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations, we end up with something similar. This is a little different trick, but over there we ended up with like U prime, U and average of U, U prime, U prime, and we said we want to model those. The same idea applies here. We're going to call this the subgrid Stress tensor. So remember, this is this has a div on top of it, right? So there's a div um, of this guy. So we're going to call this SGS, subgrid stress. Okay? SGS, tau IG. We're going to call it tau IJ SGS so that we can write the equation in this form. So remember, this is div tau. This is coming from div tau for incompressible flows. Okay, so you could write this as div tau or incompressible, and then you have a negative div tau subgrid, right? Because this term goes to the right-hand side, so there's a negative sign on front of it, okay? And then everything else is just expressed in terms of u tilt. So call u tilt phi, and then you're solving, that's what you're solving for, except that you've added an artificial thing that we call, we, we, we always assume that it's going to look like a stress tensor. It's going to have the effects of a viscous, a diffusion term, right? Because that's what turbulence does, essentially. And now the essence of LES is to model the subgrid stress tensor. Okay? Now, we look into what's, what's called the most kind of popular class for LES models. They're called eddy viscosity models. That's the same we did um, with Reynolds averaging. So why don't we model the subgrid stress tensor by using the analogy between laminar and turbulent flows and say, hey, you know, if the stress tensor, if the molecular stress tensor has this certain form, the Newtonian stress tensor, why don't we model 
assume that the subgrid stress looks like it. And why not? Because you know there it's fluid flow, and kind of on, on statistically diffusion in fluid flow is like the stress tensor, and that's exactly what we do. So we use the analogy between laminar and turbulent flows, and so then we say that tau ij subgrid is some eddy viscosity, some turbulent viscosity coefficient, not the molecular one. Again, that's not the molecular one. It's a different viscosity coefficient times du tilt by dx and du i dx j du j dx i and note that these are u tilts these are the filtered quantities so now we expressed everything in terms of our unknowns except for mu t see how we're moving the complexity around so we started by looking at u u tilt minus u tilt u tilt we called that a stress tensor then we said that stress tensor is some coefficient or is you can say it's proportional to the Newtonian stress tensor, but we need to find that proportionality constant or coefficient. It's not really a constant, it varies in space and time. And so the essence, again, now we moved the problem, uh, it's sim we made the problem identical to the Reynolds averaging problem, okay? In that we need to find an eddy viscosity, okay? Let's introduce the first model for, Eddie, for the, uh, this Eddie Viscos called the Smagorinsky model. And this guy said, well, after some scaling argument, mu t is going to be equal to another constant. Okay, that's truly a constant. Okay, mu t can change in space and time. We want it to, because we don't want a uniform turbulent viscosity everywhere, right? Because the turbulent viscosity is going to be dependent, like we saw with the mixing length theory, it's going to be dependent on the local gradient. If you have high gradients locally, you're going to be diffusing faster, right? And so, and if you have things that are smooth, you're, you're not going to be diffusing that fast. So you want your eddy viscosity coefficient to change in space and in time as well. And so Smagorinsky said, okay, I'm going to model this based on scaling arguments as um, some constant times a length scale square times the square root of the um, rate of strain tensor. And this guy is just, is just this thing over here. Okay. So all quantities are known here. Now what is, what is Cs? It's just a constant. That's a calibration constant that we can obtain from doing validation. So you implement this and you say, okay, I, need, I have a validation case that is done with DNS. Can I capture the trends from the DNS? Yes, let me try a few different constants, and then you calibrate your code. In our code, it's about 0.23 for the Smagorinsky model. Okay? Other codes could be different because implementations can be different. Uh, numerical errors could be different. Okay? But it's a constant. We typically, 0.2 is good value. Delta, the length scale, that's effectively the filter width. Okay? And Smagorinsky argued that because we're not doing any explicit filtering here. Did you see any explicit filtering? Nothing. We didn't have to apply that integral. All we said we were just going to use, we are going to solve for the filtered quantity. And we just solve for it without having to apply an explicit filter. But then Smagorinsky argued that because this filtering is embedded in this whole entire procedure, my length scale has to be the size of the sieve, an average size of the grid. And he took the average volume. You can take the average volume of a, a grid point or a grid cell, delta x, delta y, delta z, that gives you the volume, to the power 1 over 3, that gives you an average size. And that changes in space, because you could have you know, a non-uniform grid, right? Each different cells have different size, OK? Um, this is a simulation from uh, my code for the flow over an open cavity. So imagine this is your vehicle, and you know, or two buildings. You know, there's, there's one building, another building, and there's flow coming through here. Or you open your um, um, sunroof, okay, and there's flow coming from the top. What I'm showing above is the turbulent viscosity and below the turbulent kinetic energy. But look at the turbulent viscosity and see where it is non-zero. Okay, so blue is zero and red is about two to the minus three. So see what happens as the flow starts coming through. Look at the turbulent viscosity. You know, most of the gradients are going on over here in this region. And that's where we have increased our viscosity. So effectively, the, the LES equations, they look like the Rams equations, but they mean different things, okay? Because in the end, we said the stress, the subgrid tensor looks like the viscous tensor, 
and the effect of turbulence is just gonna be an augmented viscosity. That's all. Now the model for that viscosity for RANS means different things, for LES means a different thing. And in your code, you better have enough resolution in your grid for the LES to be meaningful. Otherwise, it will not be meaningful, okay? And there are many, many more um, models. There's one of the most popular ones is the dynamic Smagorinsky model, where it assumes that the constant in the Smagorinsky viscosity is actually changes in space and in time. And they develop a model for that constant, that CS. But in that case, you have to do an explicit filtering. We do what we call a test filter. And then we try to figure out, okay, what if, if, what if we refine our grid? What would happen to the, to the quantities? If they, will they remain the same? We test it. We test the idea, but it's very expensive. It's like you're doing the simulation over two grid resolutions. It's very expensive, okay? Um, because we're chemical engineers, we're gonna be dealing with variable density reacting flows, okay? And this is, again, you know, you're, so this is more of a cursory understanding of the subject. There's a lot, a lot more out there than you know, we could ever study in fluid mechanics. That's why we do research. That's why we, we, we you know, my, my research is in this area. And you can ask Mokbel at, about how complex um, um, the situation gets when we add varying density, okay? So with reacting flows where you have density changes, so, so far we're dealing with incompressible flows, but that's hardly the case for any chemical reacting um, um, equipment, okay, chemically reacting equipment or any chemical engineering process. Okay, so in practice, we have to assume that the density is not constant, um, whether it be it because the flow is compre fully compressible or low mock, there's some variation in density, not too much in pressure. You have to account for density changes. And in that case, um, what, what happens to the continuity equation if the density is not constant, what happens is you're going to get a unknown, so if you have d rho by dt plus d rho u, um, so plus div rho u equals zero. If you apply the filter, the standard filter to this, you're going to have a new quantity called rho u. So then you will have rho u, and then you will have rho tilt. You will have rho u tilt, and then you will have u u tilt. That complicates the heck out of everything. So Favre said, okay, what I want to do is I'm going to define my filter um, as a density weighted filter. So we're going to do an average on the density times a filtered quantity on the transported quantities. And he defined the Favre filter procedure as a density weighted operation on rho phi. Okay, so uh, the other way you, we say it is phi tilde is rho phi over rho bar. Okay, now the meanings of these rho phi, rho phi bars and rho bar and phi tilde is hardly necessary to know or to f figure out what it is because the solution just works out in the end. We don't have to explicitly know what the meaning of this procedure is. Except that when we recover, when we go to the constant density case, we recover the standard um, filtering procedure. Phi bar becomes equal to phi tilde. Okay? Now this is um, filtering or average, so this applies also to the RANS equations, okay, equivalently to the RANS equations. When you're doing, when you're dealing with reacting flows or variable density flows, compressible flows, you have to do what's called Favre filtering or Favre averaging. So with continuity, um, this is what happens. You just get, so now you see you have the row bar as a quantity that you're solving for, and then you tilt as the filtered quantities. They're separated. You don't have rho u bar, okay? We can do that, but the, it complicates everything. You're gonna have to introduce um, subgrid quantities for the continuity equation as well. For momentum, um, it gets a little bit more complicated, so I'm gonna go through this a little bit faster because you're not, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna hold you responsible for this. This is a, a, an advanced topic, but you're graduate students, so it's not really advanced, but you know, it's something that you will, you may have to study and, and learn at some point, okay? Anyway, if you end up doing computing, <laughs> more or less. Um, but then, um, so what happens again, rho u bar is rho bar u tilde, and the convective term is the source of all our ailments, and we have the tau bar, also that's the 
the, the, so 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 we defined remember we defined our our filter as the bar operation right and so we need to convert this into tilts we'll see how the p bar and the row bar g so that remains the same because g is a constant okay so the hard part two two difficult parts here is tau bar well we say like we did before we say tau bar is equal to tau tilt so we add and subtract tau tilt okay plus tau bar minus tau tilt now this represents the not necessarily the subgrid quantities, but something along those lines, something similar. That's the difference between the Fabry filter and the grid filter. Okay, that's the difference between the density weighted filter and the non density, well, no, the difference between the Fabry filter and the density weighted filter. Okay, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna neglect this based on arguments that um, we observe numerically is that this term is so insignificant that we can neglect. So we're gonna neglect that term. We're gonna say essentially that tau bar is equal to tau tilt. And by tau tilt, I mean that's du tilt i by the xj plus du j tilt by the xi, okay? Now the convective term, okay, we have a rho u u. So we write this as rho bar u u tilt. And then we do the same thing we did for u u tilt. That's we add and subtract u tilt u tilt. And that gives us the subgrid stress tensor we saw earlier, okay? Then when you put these in the equations, you have everything in terms of rho bar and u tilt. Remember, we have an equation for rho bar, that's the continuity equation. This would be the equation for u tilt, and everything is expressed in terms of u tilt times rho bar. This guy is tau tilt, then grad p bar, we solve for p bar. We, we don't worry about t tilt, it's just there's, there's, there's there's no specific equation for p bar. I mean, we can have the transport equation in comp compressible flows. But even here, for low Mach flows, we just solve for p bar directly. But we introduce these two subgrid um, stresses. Well, in the literature, you'll find that we often neglect tau tilt because the, one of the arguments that um, Vreeman makes um, Vreeman is a researcher who's alive. He has a Vreeman model, turbulence model, that we have implemented in our code. Anyway, the argument is that tau L, this tau L, comes from viscous stresses, okay? And it's like the net um, subgrid viscous stress. And because at high Reynolds number, inertia is much more dominant, that's inertia is more dominant than viscous viscosity, um, that's why we can neglect this term. However, compared to tau r, that term is smaller. However, tau r, we cannot neglect. And we, will, we use eddy viscosity models, like the Smagorinsky model, to model tau r. So all we did is just, we did some acro mathematical acrobatics to make the equations just look like those for incompressible flows. Okay? A similar problem occurs for scalars, why do we have to worry about scalars? Because in reacting flows, you're going to be transporting energy, you're going to be transporting species, and because the turbulent flow is fluctuating, and it's, it, so, so are the scalar quantities as well. So we would have to also apply the filtering procedures to those as well. And you get the same ailments over here, both from convection and from the diffusion term. Again, we apply the Favre filtering operation, the um, transient term, turns simply into rho bar phi tilt. So we have rho phi bar. And then for the convective flux, we do the same trick. So rho phi u bar is rho bar phi u tilt, but we want phi tilt and u tilt. Because the quantity u phi tilt is not, we, we, you know, we would have to model that. We're not solving for that. We're solving for rho, for phi, and u, or rho bar phi tilt, u tilt, right? And so we do the same trick in that we add and subtract phi tilt u tilt. And we call this a subgrid convective flux. And we're gonna claim that it looks like a diffusive flux, like we did with RANS, and pardon me, like we did with RANS, okay? And we call this JR, that's the subgrid um, um, diffusive, that's the subgrid flux that results from convection. We're gonna model that as a diffusive flux. And same thing happens for the diffusive flux because we have rho gamma grad phi, and so that gives us rho bar, gamma grad phi tilt. And then we're going to do the same trick. We're going to do, this is rho bar, gamma bar. Notice that for, for um, this term, I'm also using the strategy of Favre filtering. I'm going to write this gamma grad phi tilt 
as a dense as a gamma weighted um, filter. So that gives us gamma bar, grad fetal, and this little trick over here. We're gonna call this the subgrid diffuser flux. Okay. Now all of this doesn't matter because in the end, um, in the end, what is gonna happen is we turn our, our equation into something that looked like the original instantaneous equations, but we added two um, subgrid terms that need to be modeled, and we combine these two terms into one subgrid flux, okay? So that we combine these two terms, JR and JL, and we call them diffuse the flux from the subgrid quantities, okay? And then we say, well, we're going to use the gradient diffusion hypothesis, just like we did the analogy in lab for the viscous tensor, subgrid tensor analogy between for the laminar flows. We will do the analogy with um, gradient diffusion. And we say this subgrid stress looks like a diffusive process. So we're going to model it as some coefficient, gamma turbulent, times the density, because everything is, is in terms of, of the density here. But that is being computed elsewhere. But the important thing is that we model this subgrid stress as a turbulent diffusivity, okay, times the gradient of phi tilt. So now we express everything in terms of tilts and row bars. We introduce this new unknown called the um, turbulent diffusivity. And the same way we did with the um, scalars in Reynolds averaging, how do we get the turbulent diffusivity? We get it from the Schmidt number. We assume a Schmidt number a priori. And that Schmidt number is, um, relates essentially the, um, uh, the momentum diffusivity to the scalar diffusivity. And because we computed the, scalar, the momentum diffusivity from the Smagorinsky model, for example, or from the mixing length theory if you're doing RANS, okay, then you can obtain gamma t from that. And that gives you just the equation for, um, uh, for LES Favre filtered or Reynolds averaged Favre Reynolds averaged equations, they look the same like the original equations, except you've augmented the diffusivity with the turbulent diffusivity. So all of this to get back to the original equation. So I could have started by saying, hey, you know, the effect of turbulence is that it adds uh, some diffusion process, okay? It adds to the diffusion coefficient. And gamma t also changes with space and time, the same way that the turbulent viscosity changes space and time. So I, turbulence is a big deal. Mo turbulence modeling is a big deal. It took us a century to get here, to get to understand all of this. Now there are even more advanced models, um, something called the Lagrangian advanced models, um, Lagrangian models for turbulence. And they argue that because turbulent flux, these turbulence tensors, they come from convective terms, they shouldn't be modeled as diffusive terms. So they do some other fancy things, gets really complicated. Anyway, um, this is a hierarchy of the turbulence models we looked at. At the bottom, most expensive is DNS, then comes LES, and a subset of LES is, called, is what's called detached LES, where near the wall we do, um, uh, we do LES near walls, and then away from walls we do RANs. So, you know, like a combination of RANS and, LE, and, uh, and LES. Um, Reynolds averaging RANS, you have first order, second order model, zero for one equation, two equation, etc. And then you see an explosion of different uh, models. K epsilon model is my go-to model always um, if I'm using a commercial code. Um, and the next step in turbulence, this is a paper that was released um, just recently in 2019, um, they're looking at uh, actually using machine learning to do turbulence models. So rather than doing the closure on the stress tensor by assuming a diffusive process, they just model the entire stress tensor um, with a neural network. Okay, it's pretty cool stuff, but they have to learn from a lot of data. Um, some resources for you if you are interested in the future. Um, Woodcox has a great book, Tanakis has a great book on turbulence, Stephen Pope has kind of the classic book on turbulent flows. Um, my colleague Jeremy Gibbs in mechanical engineering, he's, he's, um, he, he left the university since he's an atmospheric um, uh, guy and he, he teaches one of the best LES courses um, at the university and so um, he still he has his 
um, course up on GitHub. 